bringing your truth to them so that those people can enjoy the same freedom in you that we do. We thank you, Lord. We can't wait to hear what you're going to do through Pastor Randy this morning as he speaks the truth in love. So we say together, amen. amen. Well, good morning, family. It's good to see all of you. Good morning online. Uh, you know, we have a bunch of people that are on vacations. Let's remember them that they make memories and they enjoy their time with their families. Uh, you know, Pastor Doug was mentioning, um, you know, about uh, Latif and our support that we do globally. But, you know, what about our community? We do do things for our community as well. And I think that's just as important family. And uh, yesterday, Crystal and I, we actually went over to Blessings in a backpack and we, dro we dropped off all of the macaroni, which thank all of you, thank you online for making those contributions and in, in, uh, the boxes of macaroni that are needed. They need, they actually need more. And, and I'm gonna continue to be praying on that. I would ask that all of you would be praying, but there was something that actually struck my heart yesterday. And this is just in the city of Livonia. And I didn't know this. And I'm going to try to get through it without getting emotional because it, it, it touches my heart and it makes me concerned. And I guess that's just me being the pastor. But there was a census that was actually done by a company just for the city of Livonia. And the nationwide census is, is that one in four children need assistance with food. The census come back in Livonia and it's every two to four children need help with food. Family, be praying with me. Be praying with me. I don't know God's direction yet, but as that hit my heart yesterday, I'm like, you know, we can do something about that. And, and we have initiate growth that we have fired back up and we are working and we just finally got our licensing done for that uh, to be able to handle food. And we're working with glitters, glitters. But I'm asking all of you that you would continue to pray with me as we move forward with initiate growth and with our food bank program and helping our community. Because you know what? We're inside this community. We're a part of this community. And Jesus wants us to love on those, you know, our, our neighbors as I'm getting ready to talk about today. And, and, and it does matter that we do things globally, but it also matters that we do things right here in our own community as well. Amen. Amen. Listen, I love all of you today. Are you, are you ready to, to be the neighbor that God intends you to be? Uh, you know, I, I started last week. This is just a two week series. and We're going to be closing this series out today. And uh, did anybody work on being a neighbor this week? Was anybody? Okay. Well, I got one yes, and it was it was Pastor Doug. All right, all right. I'm seeing some hands go up online. Throw some emojis up this morning if you worked on being a good neighbor this week. Uh, you know, it's going to take some effort, family, It's it, but it's going to be worth it if you try to be a good neighbor to those around you. Last week, we, we looked at a fundamental question. Who is my neighbor? And we ventured into Luke 10 and, and found out that everyone is our neighbor, and there are no exceptions to that. Uh, if we are a Christ follower, we, we learn that all of us have been in a ditch a time or two, just as the, the Jewish man in Luke 10 and how he had got robbed and beat up. And uh, we, we've all faced our challenges and been in the ditch a time or two ourselves in our lives. And another thing that we learned last week was is that Jesus didn't use, doesn't use filters at all. You know, he, he, he doesn't use filters to choose who he is going to love. He sees us without filters. And he accepted and loved people right where they were at, not where we would want them to be at. And, and that's important. You know, uh, Jesus is calling us to, to love people without applying filters. But sometimes we have a tendency to do that. I even admitted that myself last week, that I have placed filters on people when I shouldn't be doing that, and none of us should be. But today we're going to zoom in a little bit, and, and we're going to look how we can love those within close proximity to us, Wives, I know sometimes it's difficult to love your husbands. Husbands, I know it's difficult to love your wives. We're talking about neighbors today, but this can actually go into relationship as well. Amen. Amen. So, you know, let's let's commit to changing our neighborhoods and, and do that by, by loving our neighbors. Let's commit to uh, making our marriages better by loving our spouses better. Let's, let's commit to letting our light shine for Christ in every way possible and be that light. But uh, does anybody know who Catherine Booth is? Anybody at all? She was, uh, she is the, the quoted mother of the Salvation Army. And wherever Catherine Booth went, uh, said Campbell Morgan, humanity went to hear her. There was princes and, or princes and, and uh, princesses merged with paupers and, and prostitutes. And one night Morgan uh, shared in the meeting with Mrs. Booth and a great cow, a, a great 
crowd of publicans and senators were actually, not senators, sinners, were there. And her message brought many to Christ. And after the meeting, Morgan and Mrs. Booth went to be entertained at a fine home. And the lady of the manor said, my dear Mrs. Booth, that meeting was dreadful. And she looks at her, well, what do you mean, dearie? Said Mrs. Booth. Oh, when you were speaking, I was looking at all of those people opposite of me and, and their faces were their faces were so terrible and many of them, I don't think I'll sleep tonight because of it. And why, dearie, don't you know them, Mrs. Booth asked? And the hostess replied, well, certainly not, I don't know them. Well, that's interesting, Miss Booth said. I did not bring them with me from London. They're your neighbors. Loving your neighbor family is, is an overflow of loving God. I remember when I was 18 and I was headed to Georgia, and, and, and this story just popped up out of the blue the other day to me, but we were on the highway and we were, uh, I was in my, my, my first vehicle was a Chevy S10. Even though we were a Ford family, my first vehicle was a Chevy S10. I'll never forget it. Five speed. I thought I was the coolest thing ever when I turned 16 years old. <laughs> But we were, we were on our way to Georgia, and we were on I-40 East, and we were in North Carolina in the mountains. And it was just after dark, and my parents were following me because I, I, I couldn't ride with my parents. I had to take my truck and show all my friends down south. So I was driving in front of them, and the next thing you know is I see this car, and it whips around in front of me. And the next thing you know, it hits the side of the, the, the mountain, and it just starts doing these flips. Well, we slow down. And I pulled over and the next thing you know, I'm getting out of my truck and I'm running toward the wreck because it's upside down on the car. And, and as I'm running toward the car, all of a sudden I hear my mother's voice. I'll never forget it. She yells it as loud as she could. Stop, it may blow up. And you know, I, I look back and then out of disobedience, I was disobedient. I, I actually, I kept running toward the wreck because I was concerned about the people. And uh, you know, it, 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 it just, it, there was no thought process. I just moved and I just did it, right? And I'm not, I'm not sharing this today, family, to get a pat on the back or say, oh, look at me. And, and by no means am I comparing myself to Jesus as I use this, use this story as an example. And after, you know, after it was all over, I got back in my truck and we were back on the road, back on I-40, and I began to actually think about some things. It crossed my mind about, well, what if it had been, you know, a real dumb move on my part? What if, what if that car would have exploded? You know, there's a possibility that I wouldn't be standing before you today if it had, had exploded. And I, you know, I got to be thinking about all that stuff. And then I said, you know, I got to be thinking about some other things too. And family, when you know how much Jesus loves you and values you, you're, you're able to love and value your neighbor. And I begin to think about Jesus in this scenario with, with this accident and and would he have done the same? Would, would, have, would Christ have done the same as, as, as what I did? And I begin to think about what he, out of obedience, chose to do for you and I because he loves and values us. And see, the thing of it is, is the reason why I bring up this story, and I said, I wanted to be sure that you didn't think I was comparing myself to Christ, is because unlike the wreck and not knowing the outcome, I didn't know whether or not that car was going to blow up, okay? I want you to understand that. I didn't know the outcome. But then I begin to think about Christ. Jesus, he always knew the outcome and the consequences of rescuing us from a sin as he headed to the cross. He knew the outcome. He knew what he was up against. He, he knew that it was going to cost us something. We learned last week that being a neighbor and, and being a brother and a sister may cost us something. But he knew that it was going to cost him to fulfill his father's will. The scriptures, they show us that. That, that he knew, and, but yet that didn't deter him from rescuing humanity from the spiritual train wreck that it was headed to because of our sin. Unlike me not knowing about the car, he actually knew. He knew we have something to be thankful for. Matthew chapter 22 is going to be our main text today, verses 34 through 40, and it'll be an NIV translation today. Read with me. It says, hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And this is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. 
And then ending with verse 40, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Father, I'm thankful for today. I'm thankful for my family that is here, those that are online. Father, we, we thank you for this day. I pray that not one word roll off of my tongue that you do not want spoken, Father. Let it be led by your spirit, Father. Touch our hearts, open our hearts that we would receive and apply to our lives today. It's in Jesus' name, amen. So family, the, the Pharisee code of morality was it consisted of minute rules and regulations. And here we see once again throughout the gospel that the Pharisees and the Sadducees are always trying to uh, prove, disprove Jesus uh, his, his teachings and, and how he does things. They're always against him. And uh, Jesus, he sums up all these moral obligations in, in this text in the word love. If we think about this, it's expressed in a twofold direction of God and neighbor. And the design of these questions was to try Jesus. It, it was to tempt him, it, you know, maybe to try, but not so much as knowledge, but as his judgment. And, you know, this was a, uh, a question disputed among the critics of the law in that time, in that culture, some would have the law of circumcision to, to be the great commandment. Others, the law of the Sabbath. Others, the law of sacrifices, according as, as they stood affected and, and spent their zeal and their time in, because these guys knew the law, the Old Testament law. But, but Jesus, he's speaking here and, and telling them and us that the law is fulfilled in one word, and that is love. It won't be on the screen today, but Romans 13 and 10, uh, it says, Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is fulfilling the law. I like how many, uh, Matthew Henry puts this this morning, family. He says, Love is, leading, is the leading affection which gives law and gives ground to the rest. And therefore that, as the main fort, it is to be first secured and garrisoned for God. Man is a creature cut out for love. Thus, therefore, is the law written in the heart that it is a law of love. See, love is the first and the great thing that God actually demands of us, to, you know, of you and I. The first great thing that we should devote to him is our love toward him. We are to love God because he's our creator. He's our owner. He, he's our ruler. We are to be good stewards over everything that he gives us. We should be obedient to him. As Christ was obedient to him, going to the cross and, and depend on God and, and depend on him in, in such a manner that we don't depend on anything else but him. See, family, our love for God, it must be a sincere love. We, we, can't, just, we can't just give him lip, lip action, see, and say, oh, I love God. We actually have to mean it with our hearts as well. Because, see, the thing about it is, is I can smile. I can put on a $2 smile. Oh, yeah, I can, I, can, I can put on a good smile. And I can say, yeah, I love the Lord. But inside, am I actually lining up? And I may not be. So you can fool everybody else that's here and in front of you. Or you can fool, and I'm not saying none of you don't love the Lord, so don't think that today or come talk to me afterwards. Pastor, why did you say that? I'm not saying that. But the thing of it is, is that we should be able to line our hearts and our lips up with anything that we say, especially when we come to adore and worship our Heavenly Father and Christ and everything that they've done for us. Because of his obedience, you and I have salvation and eternal life. But we are, we got to make sure everything's lining up, right? You can tell, you can, I, I can tell Dave that I love him. But do I really love him? Is he really my neighbor? See, that's inside of me. And see, that's where God knows. God is the reader of hearts, family. You can't trick God. It is to be a strong love, and, and we are to, to praise him. You know, Psalms 103 and 1 talks about it. And our obedience, it shouldn't come out of love. You know, our obedience should come out of love for him, and not, not because we have to or it's the right thing to do. Because if you're just doing it, if you're just sitting here today looking for some type of outcome because... Uh, it's the right thing to do. No, God wants you here because he wants you to be loved and he wants to be loved by you. And, and, and yes, we, we come to church and we lay our problems at the foot of the cross and we ask Jesus to take care of them. But the thing of it is, is, is we do things out of the heart, not because it's the right thing to do. And see, the thing of it is, family, is we're missing it. We're missing it and we're painting a Bob Ross style picture instead of a Picasso. If you know who Bob Ross is, him and his hairdo, let me explain what I, what I mean by that. When you do something wholeheartedly for God and, and out of love and it's, 
led by the Holy Spirit, there is something beautiful that takes place and it begins to supernaturally transform when you do something for God. And are you going to dip your brush with love and paint something that brings God glory? Or are you going to dip your brush in something that's not going to bring him glory? To love our neighbor is ourselves is the second great commandment, as the scripture says today. Loving our neighbor, our brother, is a, it's a choice. You can, you can choose not to. Uh, you can choose to punch him in the nose if you want to. I don't recommend it. You might go to jail. You can think about it. I even admitted to that. It happens. We're, 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 we're not perfect, family. None of us are perfect here that, that are here today or online. But we physically see them, and, and, and we actually haven't seen God, but we physically see our neighbors. But the, word, the word's clear that our love to our neighbor is evidence of our love to God. I want you to look at the scripture. It'll be on the screen, 1 John 4 and 20. And this isn't the 420 that gets you high on life. This is the 420 that's going to kind of give you an insight of what God's actually doing here, okay? I made a joke and it just went by over what everybody said. <laughs> everybody got it. Okay, cool. All right, I'm, I mean, I'm trying to be that cool pastor this morning. <laughs> Let, let's read the scripture. Whoever, who, <laughs> I was going to go somewhere, but I'm not. Let's get a scripture. <laughs> whoever, <laughs> are you cool, man? No, whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. And whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. See, our, our, our context in, in Scripture today implies that we also should love ourselves and be watchful and, and have a regard to, to our, you know, the, our dignity, our character, and be concerned for our welfare of our own bodies and our souls. And, and you know, we might have somebody today, and, and although Jesus said that, that, that we should love our neighbor as ourselves, which implies self-love, right? It implies self-love, but... We, you know, we might have a resident theologian sitting here today or somebody that's thinking about the Apostle Paul in the scripture in 2 Timothy where it says, uh, chapter 3, 1 and 2, it won't be on the screen, it says, which says, in the last days, perilous times will come for men will be lovers of themselves. And immediately it kind of throws up some red flags and we're like, the idea of loving ourselves sounds like some sort of last days deception or new age twist on what was actually meant to be an act of worship directed to God. But see, that's not the case because how do we reconcile these two ideas, family? It's simpler than we actually think. The Apostle Paul is speaking of a time when people love themselves instead of loving God or others. He's highlighting self-worship born out of rejection of the gospel. But see, Jesus, he's speaking of self-love that, that actually flows out of loving God and flows into loving others. If we love God, his, his love is flowing through us. And, and when we sit down beside people and we, we actually start to begin to talk to them and open up to them, all of a sudden they're like, what's so different about this person? There's just something different and I can't put my finger on it. And yet it's the love of God. And what we really realize very quickly is that God loves his people. He loves you. You are the apple of his eye. You are so important to him and you matter. And because God loves us, when, when we return that love to God, we learn a biblically healthy self-love, family. We, we, we love ourselves because God loves us, we, and, and he's conforming us to, to be more and more like him, and self-love becomes transformational. And when we love and value ourselves based on the finished work of the cross of Jesus, that's a great thing. If we're, if we're to lay love our neighbors as ourselves, that, that has some meaning to it, then there's some things that you and I actually have to do if we're going to love our neighbors, right? We can just say it, but, you know, if we go back to James from last week, James, you know, talks about faith and talks about works. And, and if you have faith, you have works and you're going to believe in God and you're going to make steps, right? And, and of course, I'm just paraphrasing all of that, but we can go back into James 2 or you can revisit James 2 after uh, the, the worship experience today. But we have to do things for our neighbors. We need to honor them. We need to esteem them. Don't wrong or, or injure anybody. To have a good, good, you know, experience with, with will to all, not wish something the bad to happen to them, but to wish the very best for them. Family, it's, it, it, again, it goes back to our thoughts that only God can read and see in your heart. He wants us to purely love 
ourselves and love our neighbors. You know, in a lot of instances, loving them to the point it actually costs you something. We talked about cost last week. And, you know, if we look back at Luke 10, it cost the Samaritan not only time, but it possibly could have cost him his life. He could have got beat up, but it also cost him money because he took care of this Jew. But for you and I, it may actually cost us something. And to be true, to, to be a true servant to the welfare of others, it's going to cost us something sometimes. And then we get right into the end of the text today. It says, all hang upon the law. You know, if we look at that very end, it, it hangs about this four-letter word, love. For God, you know, we look at three, six, John 3, 16. For God, what? So loved the world. It hangs in balance, this word love today. And, and I can't stress it enough. And, and it all falls to, the, you know, all these things you take away love, it, it all falls to the ground and it comes to nothing. Rituals and, and ceremonials, they, they must give way to these, this, this word and, and all spiritual gifts for love is the more excellent way is what Jesus is telling you and I. This is the spirit of the law which animates it. It's the cement of the law and, and it joins it and it's the root. It's the, the spring of all the commandments, Pastor Doug. You know, the whole Bible and, and not only of the law of the prophets, but it's the gospel too. Right? Am I right or am I wrong? He thinks I'm right. He's not saying anything. You're right. Amen. <laughs> only supposing this love to be the fruit of faith. That we love God in Christ and our neighbor for his sake. So how we love God, family, will be a, a direct indication as how well we're going to love our neighbors. And this may sting a bit, but if you're too busy for your own relationship with God, you're not going to have time for your neighbors. So as, as a pastor, I'm going to ask you this this morning. I'm not going to raise hands. I'm not going to embarrass anybody. But are you taking time for Jesus? Are you taking time for God each and every day? Do you have a pattern of waking up in the morning and pulling out the word of God and reading a few verses or maybe a chapter or two? Are you got a pattern where you're getting up and before you get your cup of coffee, you're actually praying for the day and praying for the things that are needed and praying for those around you and loving your neighbor like God is calling you to love them? Because the only, you know, loving them is also praying for them. There are things that, that you and I need to be doing. And if we're too busy to do all of that, how can we actually have time for our neighbors? You can't, you can't help your neighbor if you're pouring from an empty cup. And you're always running around frantically. You'll never stop to be present with your neighbors. You'll just say hi. And I'm going to tell you what, family. I, I am subject and I am guilty of this. There are days sometimes that I will see my neighbor. And he'll start, they'll start, one of my neighbors will start talking to me. And I'll be like, God, I'll just be glad when they just shut up finally so I can just walk away. And I'm being honest. We all have this happen to us sometimes, right? But there, there's something that needs to change for you and I for us to be present. And on, on the flip side, if, if we're abiding in, in Jesus and we're serious about our time with him, that overflow into our interactions with God and, and Jesus, and, and it, it, will, it will overflow into time spent with our neighbors and and there's something that I want you to take with you today on this. And it's so important. If we're able to have peace and joy and be fully present, this will speak volumes to our neighbors. This will speak volumes to our community that is around us if we have time. And they see the joy and they see the peace in us. And what we see over and over again all throughout the Bible is that we can't disconnect our relationship with God from any area of our lives. We need him in every area. We can't, we can't compartmental, compartmentalize a Christian life. We can't divide it into sections and, and categories. And, and, and it cannot have filters when it comes to love either. I don't know about you, but I want a, somebody that's going to love me for me and love me for who I am right now, not who somebody I'm going to be six months down the road. I want to be accepted for who I am and in and, and my way and, and everything else, no matter what's going on with me. I just want to know that I'm loved without filters. And if you're wanting that same thing, then there are others around you that want that same thing. It cannot be what we want it to be, family. Jesus established the gospel and he teaches us what it should be. Love God, love yourself, and love others. 
You know, I, I mentioned a couple weeks back, and I made fun of it, and I, uh, Tim the Two Man Taylor, and it's not often that I bring up shows because a lot of, some people don't know them, some people do, but it was the Home Improvement television show. Uh, it, does anybody not know who that is today that's, that's here? Does everybody pretty much know who Tim the Two Man Taylor is? Okay, right on. So Tim Allen is one of the characters, and he's got this neighbor, and this neighbor's name is Wilson. Well, if you watch the, the sitcom, the only time that Wilson and Tim are talking, you always see Wilson like this. And he's always peeking over his fence, and he's talking to Tim and giving Tim advice, and, and you know they're talking back and forth. And what, what's interesting is, is that Wilson, he never shows his face during the entire season. And then it's not until the final episode that we actually get to see who Wilson actually is. And we never really know who he is. But see, the ideal isn't a great model for how we should go about being a neighbor. We shouldn't be looking over the fence and just saying, hi, how are you doing? And not letting them see us completely. We want to be intentional about getting to know our neighbors and doing life together. And the thing of it is, is I'm not just talking about your neighbor that is next to you in the next house. Don't, don't limit yourselves to that today because that's, something, that's not a limit that I, I want you to put on yourself because we can be in the grocery store and be a neighbor to somebody. So what do we do with all this in, in, in the text of this today, family? You've got to be present. You, you've got to be present. Jesus was present everywhere that he went in the Gospels, and you can't show me anywhere where he wasn't. He, he not only knew his disciples' names, but he knew who they were. You know how he got to know who they were? Well, yes, because he's all supernatural and powerful and he knows everyone, but he actually talked to them. We read in the Gospels that he talked to his disciples. Jesus did life with them. He walked with them. He, he talked with them. As I was saying, he ate with them and everything in between. And see, there's another thing that you and I have to do in order to be able to be the disciple that he wants us to be and the neighbor that he wants us to be is we've got to be intentional about what we do. We can, we can be intentional and actually be that light that Christ wants us to be. Jesus, he wasn't just present, but he was intentional. He, he made the most of his time with people of all, you know, by always pointing them to, to what was more, most important, which, of course, was himself. And Jesus had the perfect balance of grace and truth. Remember that when you're dealing with your neighbors. Not everybody that you deal with is going to be something that you may want, somebody that you may want to deal with. But make sure that you're using that grace and you're using that truth. Because it's the same thing that's given to you. And there's another step, family, if we look at this today. We have to be sacrificial. Remember I said it was going to cost us something if we're going to be that neighbor that God is calling us to be. Jesus was a good neighbor by loving without filters. It takes work. And this doesn't mean that he didn't address sin, but chose to have compassion anyways. You are going to have those neighbors that you will not agree with their political beliefs. You're not going to believe maybe of their lifestyle, whether that, that, that be the LGBT community, whatever that looks like. You may not completely agree with them, but that doesn't mean that you can't love them well. See, Family, this, this world has plenty of packages. You know, I was just looking, <laughs> I was just looking at some pictures the other day in, in the news and there's still a lot of those cargo ships that are just setting out and they're just waiting to be unloaded. They, they, you know, they're just sitting there and there's packages beyond packages. And, and you know, you ever order something from Amazon? Everybody's pretty much ordered packages from Amazon, right? Ladies, I know you have. Not that I'm trying to sing with you out. Don't throw nothing at me. But you order it, you order it and sometimes you, you get your package and out, the outside of it's perfect. It's perfect. And then sometimes you get it in, in the package and the cardboard, it's a little dirty on the outside. And sometimes you, you wonder if the goods inside even survive because the package is beat up pretty bad when you actually get it. Anybody got any of those packages before I have? You're like, wow. You know people are like packages. There are some on the outside, family, they, they are perfect. They are physically fit. They are successful. They are sexy like me because my wife tells me I am. I'm kidding. But hear me out. There, there are some that 
that have some scars on the outside and they may be a little dirty. And maybe it's because they've been around the block a few times and ended up in the wrong destination because packages do that sometimes. And then once they get back to their location, they're only to be sent out again. You know, people are like packages. See, when you open the package from Amazon, you don't like the quality of the contents inside. I've, I've had packages like that. You don't like them. So you, you get to wrap that package back up and you get to send it back out and you get a full refund and it doesn't cost you a dime. David, you would come back up. When you're a loving neighbor and disciple family, you need, to, you need to really take this with you today. When you're that loving neighbor and that disciple and that person opens up to you, because they will, because they're going to see a light, they're going to see something different about you, and they're going to open up to you. And you find that contents inside them to be what you don't like, it doesn't give you a right to grab the Gorilla duct tape and seal them back up. It doesn't. You don't get to put a poster stamp on their forehead and send them around the block. That's not what it's about, walking a Christian life and loving our neighbors as ourselves. You're not going to get a refund either this time when somebody opens their life to you and, they're, and they're, they're sharing their deep feelings and their hurts and they're sharing their past and, and all of these things that are going on because it's going to cost you something, family. But see, if it's going to cost us something, every time we think it's going to cost us something, we should remind ourselves what it cost Christ at the cross. The cross. Let's remember that, that it cost Jesus something too for all of us, we've, we've got this eternal life because it cost him something. See, I think sometimes we've got a, a spirit, maybe possibly of entitlement, or we think we're entitled just because we've accepted our Lord and Savior, but yet he freely gives us this salvation. And, and, and it, not to have this false sense of entitlement, we should have a more of a, a spirit of humility and be so thankful and, and, and so grateful that he went to the cross for you and I and that we should share it with others. Let's remember that, that God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And one thing else that I'm going to tell you today, family, you're not, you're not going to find in people what you might find in packages when you open them up. Can anybody tell me what that might be when you open up a package? What comes in packages? Instructions. See, the thing of it is, is that you and I, we are not open. We're, we're not called to put people back together. We're not called to put the pieces that are broken back together for them. We're called to actually love them. You cannot physically fix or put together what needs a, a supernatural intervention, a, a intervention, a, a touch from God, a touch from Jesus. But we're called to love them. Jesus, Jesus was with me that night, family. If all of you would stand with me. He was with me that night in, in, in North Carolina. I know he was because I'm here. He was, he was at the wreck. To answer the question, what he had done the same, he was at the wreck before I was because you know what? I didn't tell you at the beginning, but I'm going to tell you now. Do you know that everybody that was in that wreck survived? One of them got slung out of the car. I talked to him while he was laying on the ground. But Jesus was at that wreck before I, I could get there. See, that's the thing. Jesus leaves the 99 for the one. He does it for me. He does it for you. He does it for everybody that's on the line today. He leaves the 99 for you. He runs toward those that may look like their lives are a train wreck. And I don't know about you, but sometimes my life feels like a train wreck, family. And I'm a pastor, and I still don't have everything figured out in life, but I just know i got to keep loving him, and I've got to keep following his word, and I've got to do my very best for him. That's all I know how to do. And I still don't have it all figured out, but he's there for me and he takes care of me. And he does this very, very same for all of you. 
he runs toward those that may look like their lives are a train wreck and he's already paid the cost. And that's an awesome thing. Jesus opens the package, metaphorically speaking, and says the contents are good because of my blood and my sacrifice, Jessica. He loves you. So family, I'm going to leave you with this today. Let's run like, let's run like Jesus. Let's love like Jesus. Let's, let's love God, love people, and do stuff, church. We don't have it posted back there on the wall for nothing. Let's be that light that God has called us to be. Because great things happen when a body of believers are willing to love and reach a community for Jesus. Stepping in faith and believing. And I'm believing for all of you. See, there's a thing. Sometimes we need to actually get desperate. And I didn't bring it up until, until now. We're praying on Thursday nights through the entire month of July and the entire church family is invited to come and go as they please from 5 p.m. until midnight because we are believing for our community. We are believing for our nation. The Bible tells us to pray without ceasing and we are believing for miracles. And I want to invite you to that personally today. But you know what? Desperate, desperate people do it differently, family. Are you desperate this morning? don't know what, what, what way is up and what way is down. Jesus knows. Desperate people don't care what other people are thinking about them when they're at the altar and they're crying and giving their heart to the Lord. Say, Lord, I can't make it. See, we need to get back to a place where we can come to this altar and we can give it to Him. And stop worrying about everybody around you. You know that He is so worthy of our praise. He's so worthy of our love. Amen. Bow your heads with me. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this time with our family. Help us to be the neighbor that you want us to be, Father. And Father, as we have the opportunity for people to open up to us, Father, that we don't treat them as a simple package, but Father, we see them like you see them. Father, I pray for the desperate that are in this room this morning. Father, as I open this altar, Father, that they would just come and spend time with you. Father, that you would love on them greatly. Father, we thank you for this day. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Family, don't leave today. You need to leave something at the altar. Nobody's going to judge you. Nobody's going to place anything on you. Give it to God today. Maybe he's asking you just to step forward today and just give it to him. Love you, family.
keep on getting better. You 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 keep on getting better.